Welcome, everybody. It's amazing to be here with the incredible Nola Ray. Hi, Nola. Hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> We've been sitting here. All this kind of stuff, I tell you. <laughs> I know it's it's a little bit perplexing sometimes and we had some technical issues, but I think this is working. So we're all good. And Nola and I've been sitting here chatting for the last several minutes um, about all kinds of things. And it's been very delightful because we've never met before. No, we haven't. Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> so it's just wonderful. We're not on the same continent at the moment. That's probably why. Yeah, I know that makes things complicated, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, do you have any plans to come to America in the near future? Uh, no. No, probably wise. That's <laughs> well, not wise. It's just I don't have any plans. It'd be yes. nice to. <laughs> well, you're always very welcome here. Thank you. Maybe I can persuade you to come and teach a workshop or um, or do one of your fantastic shows. No, oh, well. <laughs> You have to you have to get down on your bended knee. Okay, I will. I will. You ca you can't see, but I'm actually on my knee right now. Oh, yes, please, please. <laughs> no, I I I went to the states in 1972. Was that the last time you were here? No, I was there a few more. I don't know when. I can't even remember. I went to La Crosse to teach clown camp mm -hmm. originally to the United States to to visit the great clown um, Django Edwards oh where, yeah where he was where he was from which was uh, Ann Arbor in fact in uh, New Michigan we did a little bit of work there but generally it was just a touristy thing so really I can't say I, I I've conquered the United States as yet not yet not yet well, we actually have somebody watching from Illinois right now, so that's not too far from where you were. Um, so, folks at home, please, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm, I'm streaming from only my personal page, but hopefully you've managed to find your way there. And um, if you are there, please say hi in the comments. Uh, let us know where you are, how you're doing today. Um, give us a like, give us a share, spread the love, because I think this is about the most exciting conversation I've had so far, because, um, you know, Nola Ray is kind of, uh, I, you know, I, I think of you as a kind of beacon, as a kind of, uh, you know, guru in this, in this world of clowning. Um, and I've... <clears throat> You're no. very kind, but uh, I have been doing it for quite a while. Yeah, <laughs> is that is that long time to be a beacon? <laughs> <laughs> you're you're a, a slow burn. It's gone on. I'm a, I'm a slow burner. Yes, I've been <laughs> inching my way up to 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 being the lighthouse or the beacon, a beacon. Yeah, I've been called a beacon before. <laughs> oh well, there you go. It's the first time for everything, I guess. I like it. Yeah. Well, I think I, I really think you are. I mean, um, the work, you know, it speaks for itself and it's extraordinary. Um, and I want to get onto that, talking about the, your, your work and your collaborations and your process. I have so many questions about all those things. And I know that people at home have going to have questions as well. So please, folks, if anybody um, has a question, just pop it into the comments. And I will try and keep an eye on the comments and feed those questions into the conversation as well. Um, so I don't hog the, you know, the uh, opportunities. Um, but I was wondering, Nola, could we, would, would you mind uh, if we sort of went back to the beginning a little bit of your career? And would you be able to tell us a little bit about, not, not necessarily kind of the step-by-step the, the -step story of everything, but more how was it that you came to understand clown or, or feel that clown was the thing that you really wanted to do? Well, I've come, I've come via dance, ballet, in fact. Mm. Uh, there's, there's a bit of clownery in dance. <clears throat> Those are character parts, which are supposed to be an art, funny. Um, then I made my way past ballet to mime. And there are a lot of very comical things in mime. You can be quite funny mm. in mime. 
<clears throat> but the thing that really switched me on to clown was the great Django Edwards, the American clown who now lives in uh, Barcelona. Mm. Uh, and it was really meeting him that made me think about clowning. I think mime and clowning go together. They're like brother and sister, or they're like, you know, like twins, really. Mm. And you can use your mime and your dance in, in, in delivering clowning. And that's what, that's what I did. But also Django taught me how to be, what's the word, stupid, <laughs> <laughs> quirky. Uh, you know, not so not so fixed, uh, looser, I suppose. Not that I'm particularly loose as a performer, but looser, more ex instinctive, and gave me the opportunity to improvise as well. Um, and so, looking at him, you just have to look at Django when he was working mm. and absorb what he was doing. You d he didn't have to teach you; just looked at him. And he's one of the the most extraordinary clowns. And in the old days. Uh, we, we had a big troupe, uh, Django was the magnet of this big troupe and in the end we were 25 people, wow. those were clowns, of course Django just, you know, people just came to him and we had a part of that 25, well I'm going to sit up a bit, uh, part of that 25 was a, a five piece band, <laughs> but to practice we used to go out in our clown costume just into the street or into parks and just practice, practice clowning, that's improvising, improvise, I can't say that word, improvising, yes. And I just remember in London, um, it was my clown, I was improvising, and, and, and a, a kid kicked me. And, uh, and I heard the mother say, <clears throat> go on, kick the clown. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that actually, uh, that was a lesson. Um, what did you learn from that? What was I the lesson? I learned that the lesson for performing in the street and performing for children in the street is to be unpredictable. So they are a little bit wary of you. Therefore, they probably won't kick you. <coughs> oh, interesting. So you have to kind of, you have to kind of, um, not, you have to kind of keep, keep on your toes doing different things so that people be... like, you have to have eyes in the back of your head and you have to be ready to react. Right. So I found that worked quite well. Uh, but I'm, uh, to be honest with you, I prefer my audience sitting in front, in front of me in a nice Italian theatre. <laughs> with red seats and gold. Yeah, uh, that's what I prefer. And behaving themselves. What's the best, what's your favourite theatre you've ever performed in? Gosh, there's so many. I mean, not that many, but there's. I, I performed a. I performed in the old Vic before it got done up. That was. Oh, lovely. One of the better theatres in in London that I performed in. Did two weeks at the old Vic. What uh, show was that? Uh, that was some great fools from history, mm. which was our previous show, and then Future Fool was a premiere. I premiered without any pre-shows. Some great fools from history at the old Vic. Completely nuts. I would never do that now. Wow. Yeah. And it worked. It worked okay. It was, but it was, yeah, it was an interesting, a wonderful theatre to work at. Had its own ghost. Ghost, I think. <laughs> and I, you know, it, it was, yeah, it, it was great to say that you performed at the old Vic. The, yeah. Uh, before it was done. It's quite something. So you can tell how long ago that was. Crystal Old Bit also. Yeah, that's a lovely space. Mm, they're both they're all lovely spaces. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was very interesting though to hear this sort of evocation of this old, older reality of um of these clowns coming together, these twenty this troop of twenty-five clowns sort of following Django and kind of it, it sounds very bohemian and very romantic, and I'm like, oh, I wish I lived in that era you know is that gone or is it something that you know oh, you still do that anymore but in those days it was seemed normal and natural if you're going to do theater if you're going to do clowning you get together as a group you you lived in a, a squat together mm. um, well you just do it <laughs> 
you rehearse, of course, you do have to rehearse, but not that much generally, but do rehearse. Yeah. And, and keep your ideas. Our, our idea for Friends Roadshow, it was called Friends Roadshow in those days, was we will do anything for anybody, anywhere. Um, and more or less, that's what we did. Uh, the, our sketches were quite simple, uh, really silly. We were very silly company. We had very little intellectual capacity. <laughs> It was just, sorry, I'm, I'm getting to lose my voice. I am a mime, you know, and I don't often speak. You don't, you don't need to speak very well. I mean, very much. You do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this, this um, what you just said makes me think about your shows, because you, you I feel that your shows have um, a great intellectual depth. And I was watching uh, re-watching them recently and thinking how do you start like what's your starting point when you come to make a show is it more of an idea uh, like oh i want to make a show about dictators or about um you know the nature of power or is it is it i want to make a show about napoleon or is it more i just want to make a clown show with this cool stuff and it happens to be about power and and napoleon what's the starting point since 1990, I, I stopped doing sketches. Mm. My sketches were done for about, th about two or three reasons. One was revenge, the other was sympathy. Two reasons. <laughs> and the other one was to say something, <clears throat> to tell you, to tell something. Um, but with, with the, starting with Elizabeth's The Last Stand, I, I, was a, I wanted to do a character throughout. And someone, while quite a year or so ago before I started doing Elizabeth, turned to me and said, "I can." This was in Australia, by the way. Um, I could see you as Queen Elizabeth. And that was because I shaved my eyebrows. She, she's not pictured with eyebrows. So yeah. um, I said, oh, "I can't do with all that you know, stuff." But then it's rattled round for a little bit uh, because I'd studied, I'd studied Elizabeth uh, at school. Elizabeth. Mm. First, and I started to rattle around and I started to read. Now, this is where the intellectual comes in. It's called reading and researching. I, I read about her and, uh, and uh, I, I met up with Simon McBurney um, of Complicité and I, I showed him what I'd done and it, I was still doing sketches. Um, and he said, oh, he, he was very patient. He said, Hmm. Very interesting. <laughs> very what was the word? Very not very even interesting. Very full. And then he said, "But," and that was the big but, which changed the way I, I actually work. He said, "What you should do is he just ripped the whole idea up." Um, and <laughs> he said, "What you should do is this, that, this, and that." And Matt and I, my partner Matt, went back on the tube uh, and saying, are we going to go, look, are we going to go for it? And we had two weeks before the premiere. Oh, wow. And I said to Simon, I've only got two weeks. And he said, bags of time. So what we did was, was a whole different way of performing it, performing the material. He said, you've got 20 minutes to get the audience interested. If you can't do it in 20 minutes, forget it. He said, don't do Queen Elizabeth as Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. Do, it, do Queen Elizabeth as someone else who shouldn't be Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> right. That's more interesting. And certainly mm. it was. It gave me an, another step, another way of thinking about the whole thing. So Queen Elizabeth to me was started with my grandmother who should definitely not have been Queen Elizabeth. Um, but it's how someone as lowly as my grandmother, as accident prone and, and as totally different to Queen Elizabeth, would do Queen Elizabeth. And then I took the, the salient points of Queen Elizabeth's reign, which interested me and one could do uh, visually, oh, sorry, visually. Uh, and that was how Queen Elizabeth's last stand was actually, was actually formed. And it worked, it worked, it worked really well. So Simon McBurney directed it? He, he gave me these ideas, yes. And he's, mm. I, I tell you, that's direction, yes. He was, you know, he spent 
couple of days. That was it. <laughs> and because that, that seems to me then that the very similar kind of approach with Napoleon, because you're, you know, you're this, um, this cook traveling and you discover an abandoned tent and then you discover all Napoleon or, you know, some sort of a, officers things That's, and you become the character it's research again because someone said after queen elizabeth it wasn't the same person <laughs> i don't think it was you should play rasputin <laughs> yeah i could see that I said, well <clears throat> okay uh, i read about rasputin and if anybody wants to read about rasputin your jaw will drop on the table you'll spend mm. your whole time with your jaw on the table it's a really really interesting uh and awful uh thing to read so Rasputin was mm, and then I've got to think about um evil charisma mm. all these dictators had charisma of a certain sort and evil it was so then I started reading about the, the evil dictators uh, Stalin Hitler obviously Napoleon uh, and Mao as well and uh, what's his name? Uh, the Italian one. Uh, Mussolini. That's him, yes. Uh, Mussolini. And Franco. And, you know, yeah. so I, I started reading about them. I'm going, oh gosh. And again, my jaw was dropping. And eventually I came to <coughs> notice, <coughs> sorry, notice they all, they all went up the same path. There was the same route. They did the same thing, all of them. Uh, and that's what the show is based. It's the root of the dictator. So you start with uh, you start with a defeat. All of them had been defeated in one way or another at the beginning of their dictatorship. They've been. Uh, they all come from. Also, generally, they're not mainstream. Like Napoleon comes from Corsica, so it's not a Parisian guy. Uh, so. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Stalin came from Georgia. Um, they're all outsiders. They get that, and that and that presumably really works for the clown sort of genre because we, we're talking about being outsiders. Clown is an outsider, and they're usually lowly outsiders. You know, like the I start with the clown, which was also um, I, I watched. I saw a, a photograph of Charlie Chaplin. Um, he had a short. He had a, did a short uh, film called Shoulder Arms, I think, and there was a still of him as a, a, a lowly, lowly soldier, and he had everything hanging off him: mouse traps and kettles, and you know, and uh, hardy. I think he even had, he had a gun, uh, but most of it was rubbish. And so I, I took, I, I snatched that from him, as it were, and said, oh, "I'm going to be really lowly, not even a soldier, but a cook." Uh, and I'll come on with all my junk, and that's because it makes a great noise, actually. Yeah. Um, then you can find all your props. You've brought them on. You've mm. got them all there. But when you actually do a show, you have to know, and I, or at least I have to know where I am. Mm. And I'd read about the campaign, the uh, the the, uh, f the flight, the uh, flight from Moscow. Uh, that, that Napoleon's troops made and also Hitler's troops made um, the retreat, not a flight, yeah. the retreat from Moscow. Yeah. And I saw a tent uh, which was by itself, holes shot through it alone. And it's got to be about Napoleon because all the dictators were, were influenced by Napoleon. They all wanted to be Napoleon. So Napoleon had to be in there somewhere. And so the tent is a tent with an open, an open tent, tent, otherwise nobody sees anything if it's closed, but an open tent. It has a little bed, but you don't know it's little until I sit on it, um, with, with, with what looks like a body in it, which could be Napoleon, um, and a stool. And that, that is my set. And the color is gray. Everything is gray. So it's like the snow, it's like the grayness of the retreat from Moscow. So th there I am, I know where I am. I know the colours, my uniform is is very simple. And it's about someone who really should, and again like Elizabeth's last stand, becoming a dictator. Someone who's lowly, lowly, lowly. 
So what he does, he, he is defeated, he comes across a vacuum. And this is what all the dictators is a vacuum. Nobody's there because he's been defeated and everybody's been defeated and nobody's going to run the country like Napoleon. But particularly Napoleon, he steps into a vacuum and he believes he's, he, it's his destiny to save France, for instance, save France. And he even thinks he has a star shining on him. Ah, okay, so destiny. Then he has to transform himself. And there's a big, a big trans transforming takes a long time in my show. It goes through lots of transformations, uh, <coughs> becoming different kinds of dictators with moustaches. In fact, yeah, uh, not just not just Napoleon. He can, becomes all sorts of dictators. and ends up as Hitler. But uh, so then you transform. Then I you wonder if I wonder if um you would would you mind if I if I put a little bit of it on just to, to show folks, I've got a little clip that we could share. All right. <laughs> uh, I think would be really, it's just like a very short moment of this transformation. Cause I think that these, these transformations are, are extraordinary. And I want to give people a sense if they haven't seen your work. Um, let's see if I can make this work here. Do you see that? I'm actually going to take it back a little way here. He's Hitler at that point. <laughs> this moustache is a bit like Stalin and also Saddam Hussein. This is where the, the, we become evil, because we're going to do a Hitler speech. Yes. Uh, to gunfire and, uh, uh, and war, in fact. So this is serious. This moment is, is extraordinary, I think. I mean, how you bring together all the theatrical elements. That should be a big explosion. This is <laughs> sounds gone, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think I think um, I, this, the, you know we could sit and watch the whole thing. It's, it's wonderful, but I just that 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 um, progression of the repetition of the speech, trying to start the speech, and things keep going wrong and hitting the, the repetition of hitting the head on the pan and then gradually kind of, you know, the, the, the attention to detail when you come in and, uh, you know, you've, you've 
rest got the piece of paper that you couldn't find and the moustache and 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 the stool and you're posing for the photographs but it's different the repetitions are different there's a kind of a an increasing sense of tiredness and kind of lethargy and well, he, he's knocked his head on the on the uh, pants <laughs> off and he's beginning to knock himself out yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he does the same knock on the head he always knocks his head on the pan uh, but this is a clown thing it's 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 a clown thing repetition yeah three gags it's it's a clown if he you know if he knocks his head He's going to he's going to do it again, but how he does it, when he does it, that's important. Yeah, and the timing is just so good. And I, I one one question I had um, before we come back to talking about the, the transformation into the dictator, which is another thing, but those repetitions and the hitting of the head seem so uh, accidental and spontaneous. But I'm I'm assuming that they're very very precisely well also. Choreographed. The thing was there was a sound effect with Matt had to to do as soon as I hit my head because we thought it might be nice to have a clang and my hitting the head on the thing didn't make any noise. <laughs> yeah I was wondering about that I was thinking how is that really making that noise and but the, the sound effect is so perfectly timed it's yeah, extraordinary. Matt, Matt and me have worked together for over 40 years now so. <laughs> is Matt your partner your husband? Yeah. I didn't know that he did so he does your sound for you does the sound he, he does he also did the set he's a, a very good lighting man and, and a sound man and uh, you know drives a truck and uh, makes the set and you know the sets so yes he's used wow. to sound and lighting all at the same time so that's what he does i mean the sound the sound is incredible like the whole what's what's stunning about the shows i think nola is just how complete they are like every theatrical device is there working in perfect concert and harmony to produce this kind of whole uh, experience and that there's no detail out of place it's really well, incredible we, we have a, a, our, our, um, our, uh, our director my friend John Mowat he's a man that throws things out because <laughs> you don't need it you know, you don't need it out. You can do that with this, you know, you don't have to. Yeah. And by the time he's finished with you, everything is got its place. Yeah. Uh, there's no, nothing extraneous that to you that he won't throw out. And uh, <laughs> we've, we've pared it down to what is necessary to tell the story. That's uh, wonderful. And so there's a lot of transformation so that what you, yeah. you couldn't see in that clip was that the, the podium that you're standing behind was actually the bed. Yes. And it's this wonderful moment where you, you just lift the bed up and suddenly it's a podium. Tale too, uh, at the end, um, hmm. when we see, uh, we, we take it to be, we take it to be, uh, it looks like Hitler, but we take it to be Napoleon in St. Helen, uh, Helena, Helen's, yeah, where he was exiled, because that's the end of the dictator. It was from taking control to the moment which you see when he's, he's giving a, a horrible speech with gunfire and war sounds and this is his height of power mm. and then there are cracks if you go on you'll see he gets shot at and finally his coat takes over <laughs> there's the next dictator coming up uh and he's pushed around by by his his, his own dictator his own coat has become a dictator mm. so uh, you know it's it's that kind of that kind of imagery which i, I really find i really find interesting it's puppetry in there because the coat is a puppet. Um, yeah. And there's a bit of puppetry also. It's called uh, Exit Napoleon Pursued by Rabbits. And during the show, rabbits are found everywhere, you know, dead ones. Uh, and there's a story behind that. That's why it's called that. Um, uh, do you want to hear it? Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently, after a great battle, one of um, Napoleon's marshals said, Sire, he was by that time the emperor, uh, uh, Sire, he uh, said, I would like to give you, a, a, I'd like to give you a, a party. I'd like to arrange a hunting party for you. So uh, what would you, what would you like to shoot? And, and uh, Napoleon being a Corsican said, rabbits. Right. By the way, Napoleon was a terrible shot. But, uh, 
So this Marshal, he, he, he buys a thousand <laughs> domestic rabbits. He puts them in, in boxes, you know, or lines them up along the field. And um, Napoleon rides up in a carriage with all his entourage. Uh, he gets out, gets a gun, you know, gets a gun ready. And they release the rabbits and the rabbits, they, they run off for about a couple of meters. <laughs> <laughs> right, because they're domestic rabbits. And jump into Napoleon's arms and into oh. the people's food because they're domestic rabbits. And they think that a person, even with a gun, means food. <laughs> <laughs> so Napoleon throws his gun down, you know, he gets back into his carriage, slam, I dare say he slams the carriage door and, and goes back to Paris with sued by rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the story he didn't want to get around. He said, don't tell anybody this, you know, but obviously it got around. So, and that, it was too good to, it was too good an image not to use or not to play with. So that's, yeah. why, yeah, that's why it's called uh, Pursued by Rabbits. Has, has um, Napoleon's ghost come and haunted you for, for uh, you know, for spreading the story around? <laughs> no, not yet. No, no, no. I know quite a lot about Napoleon now, having read so much about him. And I don't, I don't admire him whatsoever. Well, I, I'm going to just switch gears to some questions that have come onto the comments um, here, Nola, because um, there's some good ones. Asa Forsberg says, did you have a clown partner? A clown partner? Mm. Uh, Django, we did sketches together mm. with Django if you call that a partner. Well, it's not a partnership, but we did sketches together. Uh, John Mowat and I uh, did, did Shakespeare together. Yeah. But that was mine, really, rather than the clowning. But a lot of clowning went into that because it was, it was a ridiculous way yeah. of doing Shakespeare with no Shakespeare, uh, but only movement and mime and, and, and clowning as well. So John Mowat, yes. Uh, Sally Owen. Um, oh, yeah. In, we um, did a show about immigration, mm. uh, and that was that was I don't know what you call it clowning, but it was comic comic drama, I suppose. It was really nice working with a, a lady clown because she's very funny, very funny. Mm, mm. Do you prefer being on your own or with a partner, or is it are they just two different things? I, I love working with other people. I really do enjoy working with other people. Um, so if I could, I would work with other people. Do you people. tend to take a, a role, a, like a low or high status role with other people, or does it does it vary? Well, I, I did a show with, with the Swede, uh, Lassa Okolod, uh, 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 we played this in England and in Sweden, mm. um, which again, Shakespeare. And I was playing the lower role. I never played the high role. Mm. He, played, he was the one that talked, he's a clown that could talk. And I, I'm a clown that doesn't talk. So I tend to get the lower status. <laughs> right. Yes. And I tend to sabotage things because, you know, that's that's my job as a clown is to sabotage. So that's the way that one worked. Yeah. There was um, somebody on, on Facebook uh, in response, to, I think it was David Langdon, um, who is in the group, and he mentioned that he'd seen you do a show at the one of the fringe festivals in maybe the Montreal fringe or Winnipeg fringe somewhere in Canada um because I haven't been to Montreal one of those have you been to Canada yeah to Mont to not to Montreal to Winnipeg yeah it must have been Winnipeg and Canada. he was talking about a great show which he saw twice and it was uh what well, let me see what was it called clips short something about clips um clips it was a it, he said it was a short a piece of short routines and and turns kind of it's probably it was it's probably my sketch show which i yeah I, something like um what is it it's so long ago i can't remember what i call it uh it, it's it's called uh, uppercuts uppercuts that's right not uppercuts. Uppercuts. And that's, that's a sketch yeah. it's got about nine or ten sketches in that one and that's, that's my bread and butter. That was my Marco Polo show, the one that I started with, sketches. And most mm -hmm. clowns and mimes do start with sketches. 
takes a while for them to to run on to doing full full length shows. I spent twenty years or more doing a sketch show diff of different kinds. And did that really help you to develop? I mean, so you you talked about the street theatre or, or going out and doing a lot of work on the street. Was it sort of that the first stage, and then and then making short pieces, and then moving on to long full full length pieces? Was that sort of the, the development? Um, I started on the street. I started doing mime on the street, funny yeah. enough, in Aix en Provence. Um, I I I uh, I worked out well. I worked out that I didn't like doing mime on the street. I had at that point I only had three sketches, and I would do that to pass the hat with a with my troop. My troop would gather round. Mm. Um, present me and I would do a mime sketch and then move to the next cafe and do the same thing and mm. pass that. That's how I started um, performing, in fact, in mime, though I performed before as a dancer, but uh, in mime. And I, I didn't like it, personally, especially not mime, because someone will walk through your, your illusion and, and you really need to concentrate on mime, you really need to concentrate Right. Otherwise, you don't get the the story. If you if you look away and, and I've done something, uh, you've lost it. Got it. And I tried, and I did get. I did earn quite. I got not quite a bit of money. I earned some money, enough to buy cheese. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> what else do you need in France? You <laughs> don't need anything else but bread and cheese, and that's fine. But again, again, it's to get going. It's to to feel an audience. Yeah. But I prefer. If I'm to be on the street to improvise as a clown, yeah, I can do anything then. I can take it anywhere. A dog can come and it doesn't matter. Uh, you just have to be quick on your feet and you have to read people. Yeah. If they're not liking what you do, you leave them. Otherwise, you'll get a fist in the face. Uh, you know. But generally, yeah. they, if you read them properly and you know just how to perform to them, and it's a sort of a, I don't know what it is, it's, it's a, an observation. Yeah. They're not talking to you generally, uh, but it's an observation. You can see how they feel about you and you play on that. Yeah. That's to do with, you know, with improvisation on the street. I mean, I've heard so many um, experienced clowns talk about the street as their school, really, you know, it's where they really learn yeah. more than anything whereas now it seems to be more that people go and take a workshop or you know a million workshops with different clown teachers as their sort of route in and i don't see so much people kind of going out and cutting their teeth on the workshops. street it's not that i didn't take workshops i did i did do workshops um, mm. yeah uh, i met Django in a workshop at the city literary institute <laughs> oh interesting <laughs> we did workshops oh yes <laughs> It's not that I, don't, I didn't do workshops, but... Uh, but, the, but just it's interesting hearing that description of you, uh, really how you kind of learn that re ability to read the audience and react. And I, I'm sure that that gives you this kind of foundation, which enables you then to, to do the same for an audience in a theatre. It does, yeah, it does. And then it continues in the theatre. You still have to read your audience in the theatre <clears throat> just as much. Yeah. Whether you're improvising or whether, sorry, I'm going to lose my voice again. Oh, sorry, people. <clears throat> it's pathetic, isn't it? Now you see why I'm not an actress. <laughs> <sighs> well, you know, it's it's sort of um, also this thing of uh, we get we on Zoom these days. We're just spending a lot of time talking, and I feel like the yeah. world's becoming a, a talky place. If you find you find mine, for instance, I. I I, uh, I uh, was a pupil of Marcel Marceau, the great silent mime on the stage, but off stage. Bah, 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 bah. Oh, <laughs> he, interesting. He, he just talked. He, he was an incredible speaker. He talked and talked and talked about this, that, and the other. And, um, and what was that like being a pupil of his? It's great. And looking back, and even at the time, I thought, um, well, I mean, it's heaven here, it's magic. It was hard to live in Paris with no money, but it's magic to work with Marceau. Yeah. He's such a, he was such a, and a human person. Mm -hmm. He was very, very funny himself too. 
uh, and he was so nice, he was so encouraging. He wasn't a teacher who sort of puts the students down, you know, and says, you are a load of rubbish. You know, get no. I've had ballet, ballet teachers who've done that to me. Uh, so, but he wasn't. He would come up and he'd say, oh, I like the way you did that. And this was very good. But, and off he went and he did it himself. <laughs> he, did the, the, he did the improvisation himself. And everybody was going. And of course he did it. Perfectly, and you know, and oh. no student could ever reach that at that time the yeah. height of, of him doing improvisation. Yeah, yeah. Set, uh, so, <laughs> and we it, saw his show every. He had at the same in the same theatre as the, as the school was. He he did his show, and I saw it about thirty times. So mm. that was also you know from all angles, side up, down, you know. Is this sort of in the in the in the seventies, eighties? What are we talking? Sixties. Sixties, right? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. What, was the crew still around at that time? Who was there? Yes, the crew. Yeah. I think yes. I think uh, Lecoq was also. Um, yeah, starting up. At that time too, but I went to Marseille because I I'd seen him perform in mm. London and then in Sweden <coughs> when I was working as a dancer. Um, and I didn't know about De Crew. I was totally ignorant. Um, of course, <laughs> I don't think I would have gone to, to, to De Crew when Marceau was available. I think I still would have gone to Marceau. Uh, there's, I there's, a, there's, a, there's something I've always thought, um, not that I'm really an expert on it at all, but just my impression is that there's something more technical and uh, I don't know about De Crew. There's something a bit, a bit more less less clowny somehow. There's something about Marceau that's kind of more alive and more connected. Not, not a clown. Um, mm. He's teaching techni technical, which is, I mean, I, I think that uh, that Marceau studied with him. So yeah. it's technical, and and you have to, if to, to be a mime, you have to have some technique. Uh, otherwise, you can't see what you're doing, and it's, it doesn't work. So technically, you, you need to do technique. Uh, but Marceau had this this little wink in his eye. He had this little light. He he had, right. he, he, he had he had this way of looking, which I I can't say because the crew was a much more dry old stick. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just I just see that in your presence on stage. Um, there's this kind of constant like aliveness and wink to the audience and that this connection even when you're doing these very kind of precisely choreographed bits but then marceau said to be a mime first it's the face mm. you have to let your thoughts come through your face mm. your face does the talking i don't mean grimacing but mm. through through your your facial art your facial gestures, not gestures, but expressions. And to have an interesting face, you have to have eyes. Your eyes have to be alive. You can't, it's the same with anything. Clown, dancer, actor, if your eyes are dead, forget it. Your eyes have to really, I don't think they have to stare, but they have to be really alive. They can't ever switch off. Um, and that's what you, you have to do as, as automatic. And even if the audience is very, very far away and they can't see your eyes, is it still important? You can. There's no point in watching a mime without looking at the eyes. Mm. <laughs> yeah, they, they can see your eyes, they can see your expression, because if you have to do expressions or, or you do something without the eyes, which is not the eye, my eyes at the moment are not working, if you actually use the eyes, it brings it to life. Mm. And an audience even sitting quite far away, and they sat very far away from, from Marceau. Uh, he, he just played in huge theatres. Mm. I could see exactly, you know, he had that light. He had the light that comes through the eyes and out, mm -hmm. even if you may not see the eyes too clearly. He, 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 had, it, he had it there. Yeah. How beautiful. 
Um, there's a there's an interesting question here from Roy Bayfield, an old colleague of mine from Edge Hill. Hi, Roy. Um, he says, how did you end up as a regular on kids TV in the UK back in the 70s, as I recall? Did you? Did I? I did a few kids, kids uh, stuff, a little bit of kids stuff, but I wasn't particularly regular. Okay. Because they said, oh, let's have a mime. And there wasn't really anybody else around. So they, you know, right. I, was the, I was the person. Um, but I can't say, I don't, but personally, I don't think mime works that well on television. Um, uh, because it, it, television is very fast. Same with film. You've got to take your time. It will will work quite well if you take your time and mm. film it well. But nobody has any time, so they just stand there and do something. You know. <laughs> I don't think it works particularly well. I did my best. <laughs> well, they used to do more. They used to be much more adventurous with with uh, kids TV. I think it you know. was Ben Benison was was a a kids TV mime. What was it called? Um, God, old age is getting to me. Uh, this is the first morph was there. Uh, yeah. Uh, what's that? What was it called? The show? You mean the TV program? TV program. Yeah, that's that's hello. That's me. Hello. This is. Uh, anyway, it'll come I don't back. know, but I. I always remember Take Heart with um That's it, Take Heart. With Morph. You That's the one you're thinking of, right? Yeah. Take I mean, Heart that had a mime section. That had mimes in it too. Oh, I remember that now. Now you think about it. Now you say it. Um, I mean Morph itself was 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 extraordinary, I thought. The, the sort of there was clown sort of sensibility in the construction of those yeah. little pieces. But you'll find there's there's a behind anybody who's doing um animation there's a mime or a clown behind there they have to, as well. the timing of it yeah same as mine all clown and clowning yeah. yeah yeah incredible gosh uh i just love these conversations oh i'm so happy right now <laughs> with this conversation with you it's wonderful so that's the answer to roy's question there uh david says oh it was the winnipeg mime festival uppercuts that's right that was what we were talking about um, Uppercut. Uppercuts, right. yeah, and he went to see it several times. I did a Winnipeg festival. Uh, it wasn't the Mime Festival; it was the Fringe Festival <laughs> with my show. It was a lot of fun. Winnipeg is full of crazy people because they um, they have such extreme winters yes. there, and <laughs> they have about two months of nice weather in the summer, and everybody comes out and kind of goes a little bit crazy for two months in the summer. And they do all kinds of cool theatre. The company, the company, which was a mine, was called 40, 40 Below, it was called. <laughs> yeah, because it's very cold. <laughs> and we got there, I think it was September or something, and it was something like 30 degrees, and then a couple of days later it was freezing. It was really weird, but it, it was interesting. I hadn't really been to Canada before that, so it yeah. was, there's a lot of good animation that comes from Canada too. Uh, really, very, very fine um, cartoons. Okay. And Interesting. Must be, Canadians must be mimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and they they're very appreciative of clowns in Canada in a way that they're not in the states necessarily. Like in Toronto, there's a big clown kind of scene, mm. um, and a lot of a lot of stuff going on there. Which I don't know. They just have a sensibility around mime, clown, comedy in general. I think it. I don't know why that is because it's the English or the French influence, perhaps. Yeah. Also, very interested in uh, in clowns uh, and produce very good clowns. Yeah. The English, we've had our clowns. <laughs> now, I'm just looking at my questions over here. If anybody else has any questions that they want to throw in, please do because we've got about maybe ten minutes. Uh, Brian says, "What a privilege to hear all of." this wisdom of a living craft yes absolutely um I, I think we talked about that and we we talked a bit about the ideas and how your ideas develop into a more fully realized form but I guess there's um there's a kind of further question that I had in mind as we were as you were talking earlier about Napoleon and because the thing that I noticed 
for, about that show, and I think you can see it in that clip that we just watched, is that there's this kind of um, density of, of, of a kind of everything's condensed, everything's very intentional and precise. And everything flows to something else. So everything is sort of in transition almost. And it just things just kind of arrive at a place. And then before almost before you're you're you can see it, there's like another transition has has begun into another place. And it's 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 like that for an hour. And I thought, how you know, how do you it's like an intricate painting that you've just kind of spent years over getting every single point just right and i'm just kind of amazed how you it's you know the process of composition there it's called the director john Merritt. Uh, <laughs> saying ah that doesn't work uh, you've got to f get that to it's it's just when you're telling a story it should flow yeah and transitions are some of the, the hardest things to make work you can do a sketch, yes, 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 but transitioning it to the next thing is, is often quite difficult. Mm. That's what has to happen. You have to really take care about transitioning uh, ideas. And one idea will lead to another one. Will, you know, it's, you know, it's like writing. It's not like writing. Though I do write, I actually, I will admit I write the story first. Okay. That's I good to know. Write synopsis, as it were. Um, and, and you stick to that. Then I try and do it. <laughs> um, I mean, just, just, just that, uh, I mean, there's so many iconic moments in that show. There was this beautiful moment with uh, a little pot that you turn into a pipe and you sort of do this whole pipe thing where you've got his pipe. <laughs> and and there's the- Something that isn't there. I don't think I use the pipe. Well, it's not a, it's not an actual pipe. It's like, um, I know, I know yeah, it's a, it's a soup ladle. You're right. It's yeah. a soup ladle. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then there's the bee moment where you squish the bee in a, with a, yeah. with a potato masher in the yeah. bottom of a pan, which is just so the bee, beautiful. In there for a reason, because the bee was a symbol of Napoleon's, uh, what's the word, the Pope, Napoleon's flag, Napoleon's crest or bees, had bees on them. Right, so, right. Not, I, yeah, I guess there must be some kind of significance for that. Yeah, there's a significance to, that's significance to the bee. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there's this beautiful moment where you're on a horse. And this is, again, a, an example of the wonderful sound design. You're, you're kind of clippity-cloppity on the horse. And then the clippity-cloppity kind of transitions into a train, like uh, kind of train noise. And you just make this little turn on the bed to the side, and suddenly you're you're not on a horse; you're in a train. Yeah, this is called mine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's staggering. I mean, it's with, just with with uh, not with props, with 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 yes, and and that particular scene, I had it was from I was inspired by Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator, mm. and the arrival of Mussolini on a train. Uh, and Mussolini arrives on a train and the red carpet's not there and they have to roll it up and put it where he's going to step down then the train shunts back again <laughs> everybody's falling mm -hmm. about inside the train uh, it, it was sort of a, a take on, on, on that particular scene when Mussolini gets out and he looks around and says, ah, very nice, very nice <laughs> and I think that they just beautifully what it does that moment is it connects all the dictators of history together because you're on a horse and then you're in a train and so it's sort of saying to me it speaks of this kind of continuity through history of dictators from different ages and they're all the same they are all the same uh, i found that by reading about them mm. generally all the same um after they've got control they have the moment which to me i'm i'm looking mm. at the nuremberg rally yeah it's as I'm doing that and then there's cracks it's always cracks uh, and then they get paranoid uh, and then they get isolated and often they die but isolated certainly yeah so so this is the clown that comes back in in a way what you it seems to me what you're doing with these historical characters is also showing the the 
you know, you're showing the foolishness, but also the humanity in a sense, like that, that they have cracks that they like, like all of us, they, you know, have these insecurities. Well, in a way, I mean, you know, dictators, are, you think that they are beyond human, which they often are, but they are still human. They're, they're human. They have, they're as weak as anybody mm. behind this bluster that, that they put on. They are human like everybody else. Uh, but they just have evil in them and they have evil charisma, which makes mm. people go, ooh, you know, it's interesting what he says. Want to follow that, yeah. It's rather than what he does. And then what he does is the reverse. Speaking of if evil charisma and control, <laughs> I think one of your brilliant things that I, w I was wondering if you could speak about a little bit is that is your aud use of audience participation because there often seems to be a moment of, of bringing somebody out from the audience and having a little game with them. And something that people are often asking me um, on, you know, for advice about is how do you best, you know, tips for working with audience members on stage? And I was wondering if you have any technical tips, like how, how do you make that work every time? First of all, you've got to choose people that want to do it. <laughs> yeah. And how can you tell? You have to always get weak, you know. Uh, you and if they go, uh, you don't use them. Yeah. You, yeah. You use them, but yeah. if they go, that you don't use them. Okay. Okay. You get the right combination of of what's the word enthusiasm, <clears throat> then you <clears throat> don't ask them to speak. Um, don't ask them to do anything that uh, is is what's the word demeaning to them mm, mm. Uh, you do the work they stand there they hold something uh, and you you do all the work if the, if your foil or your your audience victim does work it loses everything the clown must do the work you must also refer to the person that you're you're you've brought on stage and not actually work out to the audience and forget them right. to, it's almost going yeah yeah it's almost complicity, yeah. And so they feel more comfortable. And when they know that they don't have to say, what's your name and where do you come from, and, uh, which I hate. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, and what, when they, what, what they're doing is fairly simple, uh, then they, they relax and they play along. Or better still, they don't play along, I play along. <laughs> you don't want them to do too much, I guess. No, you don't. Uh, and if someone does that, you're in trouble. Mm. Then there's, a, then there's a battle. How, how has it been? Um, that, that was, that's really, really interesting. Thank you so much. Um, how has it been? I just want to squeeze this question in because uh, we're, we're almost out of time, but you've been teaching lately and you've been teaching online. And I was wondering if you'd had any, uh, how that experience has been trying to relay clown through Zoom. Well, it's been, it's been quite successful. Uh, because you have to, of course, know that they can't move very much because um, mm -hmm. they're in their kitchens, in their hallways, in their you know, in their bedrooms, in, in wherever they are. They don't have the space here like I have behind. Yeah. So running around the room and doing huge movement is, is not on, but, but actually refining things is on. Technique is on. Ideas, simple ideas is also on. And speaking about the work is also one. So, you know, it, it can be done. There are things that are lacking. If I have a live class, I'm having them running all over the room. I'm working with music. I'm, you know, I'm having them in groups. I'm having them improvise. I'm having, them, uh, there's a lot more going on. It's, even so, uh, my, my Zoom classes are two hours only uh, because by the time two hours is over, I think everybody's half dead. It really is so mm. much con concentration i think that's quite enough yeah whereas if i'm working uh i do a day i might do six hours um in a studio um it's a different a different kind of way of working but it, it does work it's it's been successful and i think i think people uh, my, my my students have liked it how do you if, if somebody wants to take a workshop with you where where could they find out about upcoming opportunities either live or online 
the, the a live opportunity will be with the London Mind Festival, the International Mind Festival, and I'm doing three days of teaching in person at Jackson. Lovely. Oh, very nice. In February. In fact, go to the Mind Festival site and you'll see I'm also doing Zoom sessions um, yeah. after that. Um, yeah. And if you go to that site, you'll, you'll, you'll learn about that and get the coordinates of it. Yeah. And are you doing any online workshops coming up? Well, this will be uh, for the Mind Festival. Um, this will be in January, February. Yeah. Um, and that's I'm... live. That's in person. Um, that is, and plus after that, there will be Zoom after that, still in January and February. Okay. So, uh, so um, again, the all, all through the, through the Mind Festival. The other thing is, if you're in Gothenburg, uh, the 27th, 28th, I'm doing a workshop in Gothenburg for the oh. Gothenburg Mind Festival. Oh, wow. What, uh, this month? This month. Coming up. I've got lots of friends in Gothenburg. Um, right. Yeah, I've been, I went there a, just over a year ago to work on a, a clown show. Yeah, okay. With some great people. So I will, will, will spread the news about that. That's very exciting. Um, and you also mentioned when we were talking earlier, Nola, that you were, you know, maybe looking or hoping to do some directing and, and that if people, if anybody's interested in being directed, and has an interesting idea that you're open to proposals or people approaching you about that. I will listen. You will listen. <laughs> <laughs> like Elizabeth. I will, will listen. Okay. Mm. That, yes, I, maybe that you could do the thing of, I like that, I like that, but. <laughs> uh, I try, I try to, to, to teach and direct positively. <laughs> So how could you put that before me? I can't stop it, stop it, stop it. I have been known to actually shout at, at people on stage when I'm directing, um, but in a nice way. Yeah, well, that, that's that's come up quite a lot in these conversations where this idea of the clown teacher or director who shouts and whether it's a kind of a loving shout or a supportive shout or it's... <laughs> Often they go, who's that? Uh, it's me and they say, didn't know she could shout as loudly as that. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever tried directing in mime? You know, just not talking. No, that just... doesn't work. That doesn't work. I can show them what I mean, and I often do. Um, I often do say, "Yeah, the timing." I will show them um, that I can do. Uh, generally, what I've been directing is is has been clown shows uh, which don't have speech. Yeah. Speech is not important in them, but I have also done, I have also directed uh, spoken, spoken stuff too. Mm -hmm. Mainly it's, it's visual. Oh, I'm getting, now Matthew is bringing me. Oh, look at that. This is the sound engineer and set constructor and, and um, other member of the Cook and what bottle and company. Would you like to join us for a moment, Matt? I've got to go and um, continue. Hi. 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 <laughs> it's great to meet you. Well. well, I was busy cooking. Yeah, I'm just okay. Prepping. He's prepping my 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 dinner. Right. So enjoy that. That's it's lime nice. soda. This is lime soda. It's not gin. Okay. Are you sure? Mm. We have no way of verifying. I know. You have to take my word for it. <laughs> well, um, so if there's any anybody out there who is wanting to make a show, and you know you're looking for a director, I think, you know, a little Arts Council application to work with, with Nola Ray as a director and mentor would be instantly successful. So I would, I would recommend, I would, do, I would do that if I was living in the UK right now, I think I'd be writing that Arts Council application in this moment. And maybe I maybe actually will anyway, and just fly over and work with you because... Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn up on your doorstep, Nola, with my with my little sketch. Yes, the house council said I can come. Here's my sketch. What do you think? Like this. <laughs> and I'll, you know, you'll have to say yes because I won't have anywhere to edit anywhere else to sleep. I don't live there. Well, you have to come down to Ashford, <laughs> sleep in the garage. Sure. Sounds good. No, no, it's all right. 
<laughs> well, it has been really a pleasure talking to you um, and meeting you for the first time. So I hope we can do this again, because I feel like there's a whole lot of stuff that we haven't talked about. No, it's, I'm sorry. I've lived so long and I've had so much many years. Um, there is quite a lot. There is a lot of, of great value and interest. Um, and I, I'm hoping to keep going with these conversations and maybe at some point I'll recycle and go back to everybody else, everybody again, or bring people together into groups or something and have, the, have you know, so you can tell me who you'd like to, who else you'd like to talk to. Maybe Django would be good. Ah, Django. I've talked to Django before. <laughs> you don't get a word in Edgeways. <laughs> oh, right. Maybe I should. I'm, I'm talking to Avner in a couple of weeks, which I'm excited about. Yeah. Av Avner, yeah. the eccentric. Um, next week, I'm talking with Mick Barnfather, mm -hmm. which should be interesting. But I think Django would be, uh, yeah, he'd be a good one. Django would be would be quite something. He wouldn't be very disciplined though. That's okay. I'll just sit and watch and be entertained. Django is <laughs> I tell you who I'd really like to speak to is Bill Irvin. Oh yeah. Okay. I don't know him very well, but I expect that um He's a great a great Miami clown. No yeah. Clown. He, I know who, who you're talking about, but um I've, of course I've seen his work on on the internet I've never seen it live but he's yeah he was um let's see uh one of these the pickle oh was he in the pickle yeah was he in the pickle wasn't he? Mm -hmm. yeah amazing amazing clown i'll definitely get him on that's a great idea he's a, and uh david shiner is another oh one. yeah yeah david shiner i believe yeah yeah, they're part, I clan partners, I think. I don't know. I know David China. I think he's been in Paris and done the Paris thing. I'm not sure about Bill Irvin. I don't know his background, but he might well have done. Yeah. In the old yeah. days, in the old days, everyone went to Paris to learn these things. And I just, know. Now we just now we can just do it on Zoom. In the seventies, the, everybody went to Amsterdam to do clown and be a clown. Amsterdam was the place. Oh, really? Didn't know that. And nowadays it's Barcelona. Yeah, yeah Barcelona is, is, a, is a big Barcelona has taken center. over the, yeah, the, uh, the mantle of the yeah. capital of clowning. Uh, mm. Germany's, Germany too, so yes, there's quite a lot of, of interest in Germany, Austria. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But in the old days it was Holland. <laughs> Interesting, I didn't know it. I, I think the only Dutch clown I know is um, um oh gosh his name has gone completely out of my head now um joss joss huben you know oh, yes yes but yes. he lives in, he, he's belgian oh belgian. excuse me yeah. terrible oh and belgians i don't know why but belgians produce wonderful clowns he is amazing joss huben, i don't know yeah. what there is about belgium that produces clowns but they do mm. wonderful clowns uh not so much in holland I might, I might be getting you know, I might be speaking yeah. in there, but uh, in our day, uh, in the fringe in Holland, there weren't that many clowns that were Dutch. They're all English. Mm. Americans, English. Generally. The English, the English clowns yeah. taking over the world. Yeah, that's it. That's what we did. Yeah, we're good at that. <laughs> our fringe theatre in those days was very strong, not just clowns, but our fringe theatre was was very strong but nobody gave us any money mm. uh, or, or places to work so we all went to Amsterdam <laughs> where people would well it's, just, it's the same now I mean Europe you know we can't go because of Brexit of course but there is a lot more money for artists in Europe than, than there is in England often more more possibilities of, yeah um, yes it's, it's quite hard to to make a living in, in England to tour in England um, they don't pay enough yeah um, but it's well not, on I love to. I do like touring in England, but uh, well, get back to it, Nola. We all want to see you on the road again. You'll have, you'll have a ready audience. No, I, I've retired now. I retired from that kind. That kind okay. Of thing. Okay. I'm too long in the tooth. <laughs> I can well, because I need to do it, so I'm now doing it another way. On that note, I'm gonna I'm gonna say thank you very much to everybody out there who is watching and. 
everybody. Your questions and comments and everything, and that people are going to watch it later on. Um, thank you so much, Nola, for, for giving up a, a chunk of your time to talk to us. It's really been delightful talking to you. I've loved every minute of it, so thank you. Talking to me, making me talk. <laughs> <laughs> no more talking. All right, so goodbye, everybody. Farewell. See you again next week for another conversation. Bye.